In the 80s and 90s, researchers at Xerox PARC thought that the scarcest resource in the future would be our attention and not technology. They came up with the phrase calm technology to describe a future in which technology lived alongside us, helping us out and giving us more human time instead of taking it away. I'd like to talk about that today and how we can redesign technology in a way that amplifies the best of humans and the best of machines so that we can get our human time back and fulfill the original promise of technology. Hi everyone. One of the original promises of technology was to give us more time to free up our time from the things we didn't want to do. How many of you feel like you have more time because of technology? Do any of you have more time? All right. Well, I'd like to talk about that. Uh, my name is Amber Case. I am now a research fellow at the Institute for the Future in Palo Alto. So this era of interruptive technology is the thing that we have right now. We are being interrupted by our phones running out of batteries. We're being interrupted by text notifications and push notifications. The Greeks had these two words for time. One is chronos time. And we need chronos time to guarantee things will happen again and again in a serious way. But the opposite of this chronos time, the Greeks called kairos time. Kairos time is human time, is the non-computer time, it's the non-interrupted time, it's the time of being bored. This is something that's irreplaceable, that you can't automate, that you can't solve with AI. This is what makes us human. How do we amplify Kairos time and get some of that time back? How do we let machines do what they're very good at and us do what we're very good at? So, so we need a calm technology. And calm technology is not my idea. It came from Xerox Park, which is a really interesting research center in Palo Alto. In the mid-90s, starting in the 80s and mid-90s, researchers showed up at Xerox Park, and they actually had anthropologists, artists, and technologists together. Because the artists would kind of come up with a future, the anthropologists would be really good at understanding the human element, and the technologists would build new tools. They had an internal network, Ethernet came up there. What we have is the graphic user interface came from there. The original idea of an invisible technology from Mark Weiser is so clever. It's, that, it's a technology that amplifies who you are as a human and extends yourself so that you focus on the task and not the tool. So you actually need to have the least amount of technology to get the job done and be very clever about it. That doesn't mean we need less tech. We just need clever tech. My favorite quote from Mark Weiser is that we don't need smarter technology. We need smarter humans. How can we have technology work alongside us to make us smarter so that we have better decisions that we can make? So how do we design calm technology? I found a few of their principles, tried to bring them back to life, tried to modernize them a little bit. It didn't take that much effort because they're so good to begin with. And I added a few for the modern day. The first is that technology shouldn't require all of our attention, just some of it and only when necessary. This is a simple thing to say. It's very difficult to do. Again, with electricity, it's not requiring any of our attention to realize that there's so much electricity in here right now. We just live alongside it. Technology should empower our peripheral attention. So if you're on a development team and you have a row of LED lights that change color with the status of the servers, or maybe the database uh, has an issue, or maybe uh, some of your hard drives are full, you could program it to change color based on that so that everybody on the developer team can know exactly what's going on at the same time. This is called ambient awareness. What can you put into peripheral attention to inform and in calm at the same time? You make a machine that tries to act like a human. You end up making a human that acts like a machine. A, a human has to say something again and again to be understood, and vice versa. If we amplify the best of what humans can do, which is curation and understanding and compassion and empathy, the best of what humans can do, not the worst, and we amplify the best of what machines can do, we end up getting a blended reality, a real mixed reality that is seamless. 
because the more automation we have, the more important it is to have a backup system. Technology can communicate, but it doesn't need to speak. It's tonal language. A lot of people try to make technology that speaks in a human voice, but when the technology speaks in that voice, we expect to be able to speak back to it at the same level of sophistication that it speaks to us, even though we know that we're not able to make a sophisticated system like that right now. Technology should consider social norms. When creating technology, it's easy to think of what's normal. What's normal right now is that all of you have video cameras in your pockets, but we're not scared of each other. 15 years ago, when the smartphone camera started to come out, people were terrified that privacy was dead. Now we know that a lot of people use their phones to take pictures of food as a pre-digestive ritual before they eat it, or they, they, don't, they, don't really <laughs> they take pictures of mundane things. But that's become invisible. The right amount of tech is the minimum to solve the problem. This is really hard to do when you say, well, I want this feature and this feature and this feature and this feature. There was always this idea of making the new. We value new stuff all of the time. But I think it's really important to respect the old, what has been there for 100 years, 200 years, because that's the stable stuff. We think the new is cool because we don't know the issues with it yet. Everything has issues. I think it's more valiant if we take something and make it easier to use that's maybe an ugly system than to build something from scratch. Technology should make use of the near and the far. If you put your phone on airplane mode, what can you do on your phone? Maybe you can do voice recording. Maybe you can take photos. You can't really access a lot of your apps because they're all reliant on the web. And you have a low bandwidth version of the app that you build so that somebody can get to it on low bandwidth, on a bad cell signal. That's usability. That's inclusivity. That's universal design. That's making stuff that works to go to the cloud all the time. Going to the cloud in the future is going to get more and more expensive as bandwidth is not expanding at the same rate that our consumption patterns are. And that will be another crisis that we have to deal with, along with cobalt mining. So if good design allows you to accomplish your goals in the least amount of moves, then calm technology allows you to accomplish your goals with the least amount of mental cost. Because, as Mark Weiser said, shouldn't our primary task as humans be being human and computing be secondary as a tool like it was in the beginning? And that the scarce resource is not our technology anymore. We've gotten used to everything being so cheap that technology, like a gas, expands to fill every available space in our lives but we don't need it all the time. I would encourage you to take five minutes and turn off all of the unnecessary notifications on your phone and see what your lives are like afterwards. Can you actually get that time back? How much of your day is spent in Kairos time? Palm technology, um, it's really short, it's really easy to read, it's from O'Reilly. Um, and then I wrote another book because I realized that notifications are really annoying and they're annoying because of limited hardware. And this is called designing with sound. How to use the limited hardware in reality to make better notifications that aren't disruptive, but are clearly informative. That will come out in a week, I guess. It's like, really, really soon. I spent three years on this. Um, I also made a site called calmtech.com. I grabbed all the original research from Mark Weiser and John Seeley Brown, along with the principles. These are beautiful, tear-inducing papers because they're so universal and so prescient that I really encourage you to read them. They will rewire the way you understand how to build technology, especially if you're on, an entrepreneur. These papers changed my life. I, I built my startup completely differently because of this, and we were successful. We got acquired, and we, had, we ended up having like 15 million users at one point, so yeah, reasonable. Because when you make the technology really cleverly, you can scale really, really well. Thank you so much.